Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so I'm Zach Kohler. Uh, my handle is Y2K Bugger. Uh, by education, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, and I originally started my career as a materials engineer, but I've slowly transformed into a software developer. Uh, some of my relevant interests, I, I do programming, electronics, and retrocomputing. Uh, some of my irrelevant interests are drawing, punk rock, and making cheese. So my motivation for this talk. Computer science is built on layers and layers of abstraction. A simple interface allows complex systems to be built. So every time you send a text, you don't have to think about the radio. You don't have to think about your software stack. You send your text, and everything just happens for you. This is really good because it allows you to get a lot of things done with the smallest amount of code. It makes the world convenient, and it makes it the world that it is today. But it also hides a lot of things. Uh, as a programmer, you may be used to working in really high-level languages all the way up here. But there's this giant stack of a computer that a lot of people don't get to see, and especially in Python. You don't normally have to dig deep into any of this. And you're, like, you're like making libraries or you're a core developer. Um, so down to the very, very bottom, you have your physical silicon. And at the top, you have your end user applications. And, and those applications can be built in many layers also. But the part that I was really like intrigued about was the part, like the very bottom of the operating system, I didn't really understand. And I kind of knew how assembly worked, but I didn't know, you know what how the assembly actually drove the silicon. I always said, heard like the data flows in the CPU and then it does its thing, but I didn't really know what that meant. So I started playing with hardware. Um, one of the first projects I had is I did a breadboard Z80 computer where I clocked down the uh, processor speed down to a single step button push. So instead of being five megahertz, it was two hertz. I was just pressing the button and I could watch as each instruction went through the CPU. Uh, you could see the, the data go onto the register and, and out of the, uh, onto the bus from the registers. I thought that was really cool, but I, I wanted to dig inside of the CPU also. So our virtual machine that we're going to look at today, or actually a CPU emulator, it's not a virtual machine, um, is called the SAP-1. It's not the SAP the company that you may be thinking of. It's simple as possible. Uh, it's from this book by Albert Malvino, Digital Computer Electronics. So this is the basic block diagram schematic type thing for the CPU. Um, you can see some things called accumulator, adder, subtractor, register. And down the center is this, they call it a bus. And I'll explain that in a, in a bit. But this is the main structures that are inside of the CPU. My interest got really, really peaked when I found this video series by a guy named Ben Eater. So he built the simple as possible in hardware using uh, LS74 logic, uh, TTL logic, 5 volts. And he built each of these pieces in that schematic diagram on a breadboard and showed how each one worked, debugged it with you, with the, with the, the viewing audience on YouTube. And finally, it all came together. And this was a CPU. And I, I was just stunned because. I, this is the first video I saw. I, I played this. And it says me working, finally getting my CPU running, and I saw this. I'm like, holy crap! He built a CPU. And he got all these blinking lights, and I had no idea how any of this worked. So I sat down and I watched this entire video series. I, I thought it was so amazing. But looking at it, I mean, I, I know you guys are feeling what I felt because th this was like gibberish. But it's funny now because I look at it and I, I see it. It should be, yeah. When it hits the output register, it would. And he's explaining it. This is a 40 minute video. So you guys can find it. The link's in the presentation. And if you go to my website, uh, you can find the links to all this. So, what I'm going to be talking about, I'll go through really quick explaining hex because you're going to see it in this presentation and assembly. I'll go through a little bit slower. Uh, I'll show you the CPU running in all its glory. I used to hide that till the end, but I figured it showed, uh, showed up front so you know what you're getting into and like what we're actually trying to do before I get into the, like, the nitty gritty. 
Uh, I'll explain the architecture a little bit and go over what are registers, what are buses, and I'll review each component, those, each breadboard on that SAP uh, one. What, what is it doing? Why do we have that piece? And how does it all come together to make actual hardware, make a CPU? Um, and then I'll, I'll go through what microprogramming is. D does anyone in the, or who in the audience knows what microprogramming is? So I get like a feel. Okay. So I'll try to explain it. But if you don't get that piece, you'll still kind of get a feel for how a CPU works in, in the first couple steps of this. But if you're, if you're crazy, then like me, the end will be cool. <laughs> okay, so I used to like go real deep explaining hex and like how to figure out what each one means. But just know when you see uh, a number that has letters in it, it's just a number. It's just a different counting system to make it more compact. You can write your numbers smaller. It's also convenient because it's a power of two. So each set of two hexadecimal numbers is a byte. So if you see zero, zero, that's a one byte representation of zero. If you see FF, that's binary for all ones. And we write it with that because it's convenient. But just think of it. Don't try to translate in your head. Just think of it as it's a number. So this is an analogy. It's not a compilation uh, because Python doesn't compile to assembly. But this is just to give you an idea. On the left-hand side, this is what we're kind of used to working with uh, in the Python community. Um, we would probably write it not like this. This isn't really idiomatic Python. But you're setting up some variables. And then you create an infinite loop, and you're mutating the state of this A. And we're saying every iteration of that loop, debug that output. Say, what is the state of A at this point? We're doing the same thing here. Load A means you're taking uh, you're taking this number from address seven, which is down here, which is four, which is A, putting it inside of the CPU. Then you're adding address eight to it. So what's it eight? You look it up. Okay, that's three. That's X. Same as over here. You output it. Oh, the screen's a little bit delayed. So sorry. I'll try to talk a little slower when I'm showing that. It. You output it, and then you jump back to the beginning. It's they're both infinite loops. So I have that here. Uh, I added a little bit to the demo so that I don't have to interrupt it myself. So the infinite loop's going to break at 250. Uh, I'll be adding 19 each time. So hopefully this isn't shocking to anyone. It's just a Python loop printing a counter. But now I'm going to take this assembly language, uh, basically the example I just showed you, with a couple other instructions added. Uh, and I'm going to assemble that. It's not compiling, but I'm using an uh, assembler I wrote to transform uh, this code into something that could be read by the CPU. And there's the assembled uh, data. And then I also put the decompilation of that assembly off to the side so that you could, when I'm debugging programs, it makes it easier to write. And so I take that. It's 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 actually a byte stream in Python. So it's just a, a set of set of bytes, and I feed that into the memory of the the computer, and then I start executing. So what you can see is as the numbers are printing, uh, you're incrementing that register, and it's updating the value of the memory location also. So I'll run that one more time. You can see the one cell that's changing. This is a, basically a map of the entire uh, memory of the computer that we hooked up this memory to the CPU. Uh, there's only 256 bytes of memory. It's an 8-bit memory address. So I showed you the assembly, and I showed you how it referred to Python. But why do we use assembly? Why, why did every? Everyone thinks, okay, that's the lowest level you could get. It's because before assembly, you, or you, you would have a CPU and you need to tell it electrically what to do next. And so we use binary in, in electronics. It's high or low. It's a voltage. So each one of these numbers is no volts, no volts, voltage. And you know whatever, whatever voltage level you're at, it lines up those numbers. The assembly is just a a direct analogy of those numbers. So the 07 is the 
the bite on the right, and then the instruction is a bite on the left. Did I make that actually seven? I don't know. Oh, good. Uh, but it's it's very easy to translate. You can see how you could take a program that says, if the assembly equals LDA, make the byte equal to 0010000. So it's a very mechanical translation. It's not complicated like a C compiler. And when I say the machine or the CPU will execute what's in memory, this is what I mean. Um, I'm going to point on the actual screen because I, I got a delay in my mouse pointer. So sorry, whoever's on the microphone. Uh, this would be like the very first memory location. And the linear address space, you know, from 0, 1, 2. And this is our assembly. When I said that uh, it mechanically translated LDA into a set of bits, we actually write those bits into memory. So you have load A and then the memory location. And then the add instruction and then the memory location. And so you got instructions and data kind of mixed together. And we can think of those like the memory location as the argument to that uh, oscillator. Um, this memory access, this is just data, or memory is executed through the data. This is a jump instruction right here. This tells you where it might have to. So basically, it starts executing here, goes through the instructions, and then loops back forever. And then this store A mutates uh, one of the instructions over here. So it's a very mechanical process. The CPU takes in this byte, says, OK, what are you supposed to do? The first one is load A. So it says, OK, I'm going to do a load A. The next one is an add. OK, I'm going to add something. And then mechanically, it, it just goes through and does that. So I'm going to go through the demo again. But now think about what I just showed you. Let me make this a little bit longer. So what instructions do I have for my CPU? I have load A, which takes a value from memory and puts it into the CPU. We have store A, which takes, it does the opposite. It takes the, the one from the CPU and puts it out into memory. That's how you could see it on, on the last slide over here, where it was blinking. Uh, I was taking it out of the CPU and putting it back into memory. Uh, output, that's what was actually printing. It's, it's like a hardware interrupt kind of. It's not, it's not technically an interrupt, but it's a uh, hardware register. And I have a Python callback for that. So anytime you run the out instruction, it calls the Python callback. Uh, jump and branch not zero. Uh, the jump allows you to do loops, and the branch not zero actually makes you do conditional branching. So based on what math you do, you could branch one way or another. So it kind of that's what makes it Turing complete, Whoever, if you know what that is. It, it can compute anything because it has that branch not zero. Halt stops the processor. No op, it just does nothing. So if you need to slow down a loop for timing, you could do that. Uh, output accumulator, that's so you don't have to put it in memory before you output it. You could just output directly from the CPU register. And the input buffer to accumulator, it's a hardware buffer that will load into the uh, inside the CPU from uh, external source. In this case, also a Python callback. So how is all this stuff moving around inside the CPU? You have, you have the CPU, and then you have memory, and you have your input and output. But it's all tied together on the address bus and your data bus. Uh, the the I/O may or may not be connected to the control bus, depending depending on your architecture. But here, the CPU and everything is all embedded. The memory is all embedded into one monolith. So. I've been using the word register. What is a register? It's just a series of bits that the hex, uh, two hex characters will fit inside of this register. 
and I can store those ones and zeros right here. The output register, the same way. It stores a little bit of memory, and it, it uses electronics to do that. Um, and you can, these are read-write. So depending on the signal that you provide to the register, it's either outputting to these eight wires, the, a bus is eight wires. Uh, in this case, it's an eight-bit bus. You can either write from the register to the bus or read from it, it's two-way. The output, you can only go from the bus to the output register. Um, so the real trick is, how do you tell all the registers or all those boards in that Ben Eater computer whether to be reading or writing? And you kind of have to control it. That's on the control bus. So load A will have a sequence of steps, and it's going to turn the registers read and write off to perform that load A or store A. That's what we call a register transfer. So there's, it's one step. Everything's going by a clock. So the clock is going, and at the step where you're going to want to do the register transfer, you enable A, and then you want to latch on the output. And what that'll do, as soon as the clock goes, this 8-bit this can go onto the bus, and then go to your being 5 volt, you want to 0 volt, 0 volt, 0 volt, 5 volt, 0 volt, 0 volt. And then there's not the register to read it. And because it's latched, it'll save it. And then the clock cycle goes, and it's stored. So that's a register transfer. This happens, you know, a couple times a second if your clock speed's slow, or billions of times a second if you have a high frequency clock. Uh, the program counter is a special register that tells you where to point in memory. So remember the execution where you're starting at that very zero zero memory address and saying, what is that first instruction? It was a, a load A. The program counter is telling you where to look in memory at any point in time. So it's kind of special. And it tells you where the next the next memory access is going to be. So you can see if you, you know, it's, it goes 0, 1, 2, 3. But you can see it's read-write. It, it, you can both read from it and store to it. And that's the trick is when you're doing a jump, you can load any other value into that uh, program counter. And then the next execution cycle goes to a different point in memory. That's how you're able to loop back and forth. That's what this little diagram is showing us. You get to this point, and you reset the program counter back to four, and, and then you got a loop. The accumulator is the one that is going to take the input and uh, output from your uh, adding system. So whenever you're doing algebra or math, you're going to accumulate everything in that accumulator. Um, but it's, it's basically a read-write register that is attached into the uh, ALU. So the arithmetic logic unit is what allows us to add and subtract. So basically, you load, you load a value into A, and then you say, add 5. And that 5 will go into B, get added with what's in A, and then stored back into A. So if A is 1, and then you add 5, now A is going to be 6. You add another 5, it's, it's going to go to 11. Um, and that all happens on the clock cycles. Um, you can never really re access register B directly. You can see it's, it's write only. So this is where it gets more complicated. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but you can think of RAM as a whole bunch of registers. But it's, a special, it's special in that it only has one connection to the outside world. And so depending on what set of ones and zeros you put on its address, it gives you back a different value. So if you remember that picture that I showed you, the, the kind of heat map of the memory, each one of those has an address. And when you apply electrically that address to the RAM, it outputs the correct value. That's how you say, OK, give me the, the value of RAM at memory location 1. It's a piece of electronics that will do that. You put 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 on it, and it will give you back the correct byte. And that's how we, we iterate through RAM. So by, so by mutating this register, you can access anywhere in memory. Uh, the controller is basi basically uh, two parts, but it's what allows you to understand what load A is. So before I said, First, the computer looks at that memory location, and it says, OK, it's load A. Now I do something else. 
the controller sequencer and decoder is what does that. So first what it's going to do is it's going to go through, pull out that load A from RAM, put it into itself into that instruction register, and it's going to say, hey, you are a load A. And then there's a set of special steps it's going to do. Load A is going to go fetch something from memory and put it into A. If it, if it had pulled a store A instead, it would have taken it from the CPU and stored it into memory. It would have done the opposite. If it was a no-op uh, assembly instruction, then it would have just done nothing. It, it would have wasted a couple cycles. And that's all done by you know, looping over the different, uh, they call it T states, but looping over the steps for each op code. Um, this is a bit confusing, so I'm gonna show it in a simpler way or like how it works in, in a second. The output's simple. You just say, you know, out A, and it writes to the output register, and this is where we get the Python callback from. It's just another register. So the sequencer and decoder. So first, the fetch cycle. It's the same for every single one because it doesn't know whether it's a load A yet or not. Then once it once it reads that from uh, memory, it'll say, "Okay, I understand that it is a load A." So I'm going to do that specific execution cycle, which in this case is uh, we want to latch into memory from the program counter, figure out what address we're going to be looking at, then go access that memory address, and then we're going to latch it into A. So this is what we call microprogramming. It's telling you for every single opcode or every assembly mnemonic that you have, there's a certain set of steps, and they're going to be different for each one. So when you implement, if I wanted to implement an AND instruction or a ZOR instruction, I would get a, give a different set of micro instruction states here. So we can actually reprogram the CPU. So you can see here, uh, I have a, I wrote a program that has just one assembly instruction. That's a load A. And that's load A is the zero zero, and we're going to go fetch what is in memory location nine. So first, it figures out it doesn't know what it is. It knows that we're going to zero zero, so it fetches what's in zero zero. Then it looks at it, says, "Hey, we got the op code. The mnemonic is LDA." So it, it disassembled it in the debug, and then it says, "Okay, we have three more T states." First one is, okay, go find out what is in memory location that we provided, which was 09. So it goes, looks up what's in 09, finds it, and then stores that into the accumulator. So we can actually run debug mode on with the full computer when you're executing a loop, but that gets very verbose. And every single instruction is telling you exactly what it's doing. This helps debug the CPU if you're going to dig into it. So we can run it, turn debug off, where we're only getting the output uh, opcodes happening. Um, some other things that I, I like to do, whereas you, you get, since it's a Python callback instead of actual electronics, you can import IPy widgets and connect to the input and output register. So here I'm resetting the callback to use uh, this just text box. Instead of printing it out, when I run the CPU in this loop, it can continuously output to that text register. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't have any more slides before I did the, the final demo. So here's another one where I, I decrease the delay so it's going a little bit faster. And I put that the memory that I'm mutating out into the middle. So you can see just about how fast it will run. I'll, I'll take out the delay. So it's, it's not very fast. But it's fast enough so that if you want to write a couple algorithms in this assembly language, it's probably going to be pretty feasible. So that's what I intend to do. And there's some simple programs that I've come up with already. So you can, you can use this value, uh, the one that we were changing, we can use that as a indirect memory address for another instruction, which means, okay, instead of writing it to the same spot every time, let's write to that new value every time. So we're writing to a different location in memory. So 
So you could see what it, what it did was as the program was running, instead of writing that value to the same spot, it, it wrote to its same value memory location. So it wrote the value 9 to memory location 9. It wrote the value 12 to memory location 12. We get some like pretty pictures. I thought that was the first time I got that to work, I was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> so here's, here's the final bit that I, I've been working on this for about a year. I've, I've, but I finally got uh, Turing completeness with the conditional branching so I can continuously loop. And I also have a callback to an IPy widget. I actually have an interactive program. So I can, I can change the value of the input register and, and interact with my CPU. So you can make a game at this point. By inputting a different integer, you know, you say, if it's greater than five, turn right. If it's greater than whatever, you know, turn left. I can make snake or something with this at this point. So back to reality. This was really cool, but what can we learn from that? So I really didn't know what was underneath the operating system. So my computer didn't really have an operating system, except for me. The first operating systems were human operators. Everything was batch processed. So every program had control of the full memory. You remember the little program that I wrote at the, at the bottom of that memory map? It could write anywhere. So imagine if you have two programs in memory, one could overwrite the other and get corrupted. This, this was real life in the like, early PC days. There's no memory protection. Nowadays, what the operating system will do, it segments the memory out, and every process will get its own little section of memory that no one else can touch. And it's doing this thousands of times a second and moving that program counter between your different uh, processes. And it's like time sharing that you know, thousands of times a second. So what the operating system will do for you is it gives you uh, memory, instead of interacting with an output register, you want to interact with displays, read from file systems, and schedule processes. So imagine like a giant memory, not 256 bytes, but like a couple megabytes or even gigabytes of memory, and having tons of programs in memory at once. What your operating system is doing, it's moving that program counter between all your different processes, you know, thousands of times a second. That's called scheduling. It's a really hard problem, especially when they're trying to write to the same memory. That's why you get, uh, you know, locks, deadlocks in your uh, programs. So just remember, you know, there used to be a human operator before there was an operating system, and just be thankful you have an operating system to do all that scheduling for you. <laughs> if you want to learn more about this, there's tons of stuff that I didn't talk about. I'm just going to read it really fast. Pipelining, networks, memory protection, caches inside of the CPU, uh, superscalar execution, out of order execution, multi threading, single instruction, multi data, GPUs, so having another processor doing something different, and actually the physics of electronics. Everything below the opcodes and below the registers makes you have to make in silicon. Or if you're crazy, I don't know, in something else. Uh, ben Eater course links if you want to find that, but you can find my slides. Uh, Thank you. How much time we got? Yeah, yeah sure. If anyone has questions. This is my favorite part. Normally when I do these, I like to have people interrupt me. So I'm like, I'm sure people are dying here. Well, I just got into FPGAs yesterday, and so maybe I'll do that before I go to hardware. But I really did want to do something like TTL logic version of this, or my or my own instruction set more of. You know, some of these are my own opcodes, but a lot of it's from the Ben Eater. I don't know what he did for branching. I think he did branch not equal. I did branch not zero. It's just slightly different. So you can implement that in the FPGA. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then from there, you know, I could debug how I actually wanted to run and before I do the hardware logic. Um, and that probably would be a lot easier than doing the actual hardware. But uh, I do have a list of things I'm doing next. There's a few. I want to do AND and OR. That way I could do bit masks so I could have buttons to do games. You know, like an in, uh, old original Nintendo, that controller is a byte. Each button is one bit in a register. And 
so you can actually connect this up to an N64 and have it play it. Okay. So, do you have any plan of making a physical PC? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's possible that you could take that and build it out of the electronics. I think that's what I'm going to end up doing eventually. Um, but the when I said FPGA earlier, that's like halfway in between. It's kind of like a physical CPU that you can morph into any CPU. So controlling that, it's kind of like halfway in between. I, I implement it at the register level okay. and the microprogram level. So I'm not simulating analog in the in the TTL or or a digital version of TTL. It's it's higher level than that. Yes, it's all up there. In fact, uh, there's there's this like my binder bucket. If you go to that Bitly link at the very beginning, you'll get this notebook that's expanded like ten times with more examples, and uh, the sources on Bitbucket. You can pull it down. It's it's pretty easy to add like an opcode or add a register. It's like you just a function call attaches it to the bus. You can actually have bu bus conflicts that'll raise an exception. So if you're writing to the bus with two registers, it'll it'll exception on you. So it kind of protects you from doing something stupid. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I took that slide out. I had an hour and a half version of this where I talked about how the clock worked. There's, there's a clock function and a data function. Okay. It's basically like the rising edge and the falling edge. Uh, the data goes through and reads all the registers, and then you have a, a byte that you pass with the clock to every other register, and it can latch it if it wants to. The latch is controlled by the control bus. Yep. No, I, I, like I said, the, f the feeling of awe when I saw this video, I'll leave this as the last thing everyone can see, because this is what inspired me. I, I cannot believe this when I saw this. It's, this was like wizardry. <laughs> it was really cool. I, okay, so this is the output. It's crazy. Follow this guy. He's really good at teaching. Better, <laughs> way better than me. Uh, yeah. Thank you.